joining us online this morning. We're happy to have you. Pastor Chad will be giving the message, Jesus Walked, Why Do You Run? Oh, there he is now. Natalie, I got to catch a plane. I'm running late. Planes at a different gate. Well, that's clear across the airport. I got, I got to run. Some... Oh Lord, why me? I've missed my flight. You ever seen that at an airport? <laughs> You've been there. You've done that. I have seen mothers dragging their toddlers along. I've seen men juking and. Jiving look like they're playing airport football. I have seen every kind of person run in the airport except one. You know who I've never seen run in an airport? The pilot. <laughs> never. Not once. I see them walking, even though they've got the most important job in the place. They're more important than the lawyer, the doctor. They're more important than the mayor if he's flying because they're piloting the plane. The plane's not going to leave without them. Out of the thousands of people at the airport, they have the most important job, and they're walking. What's your life's pace? Does it feel like a run through the airport? Sometimes mine's felt like it's been 100 miles an hour for decades. I wonder if any of you feel like that. Like you're in a sprint with no end in sight. When you do sit down, like I did here in the airport, is it really restful? No, my mind was still racing, wondering how I could catch my flight. Does your life feel like that? Always in a hurry, always behind. There never seems to be enough time. It's not a new problem. In fact, the Bible references in the book of Job, we think Job lived about 4,000 years ago, and here's what he said. I have no peace. I have no quiet. I have no rest. And trouble keeps coming. Sound familiar? It sure does. I read a book by one of my favorite pastors, Kerry Newhoff, called At Your Best. Some of the quotes in that book stuck with me. And one of them was, time off won't heal you when your problem is how you spend your time on. Last summer, I had a wonderful vacation to Minnesota. I went fishing, I think, 12 days out of the 15-day trip. I was getting getting a little raw from taking all the fish off the hooks. (laughs) And then I went to my hometown of Earhart's 4th of July parade, where I got this shirt. It says, small town, big parade. And that is an apt description for that parade. Earhart, my hometown, has a population of 131. I guess 130 since I'm here. (laughs) But for that parade, there were hundreds of people lining the street. I have no idea how many hundreds, 600, it was, it was nuts. Big parade, and as part of the parade, there were several trucks that had huge water tanks and hoses, and they were spraying the crowd in the summer heat. Now, my cousins, always the thoughtful and considerate ones, thought, I bet those guys spraying all the water are getting hot too. So they brought coolers full of water balloons. So there I was in my 50s, (laughs) having a water balloon fight with water trucks in a parade. It was glorious. My cousins and I claimed victory. And if there's a Norwegian water balloon Valhalla, we have assured our place among the heroes there. In January, my Uncle John and Aunt Carol, who also live in Minnesota, decided they'd had enough snow and so they rented a condo in Port Aransas, and they said, hey, Chad, 
why don't you come visit us? We've got a, an extra room. You can stay for free. Well, it would have been years since I'd been in Port A, but I went down there, and it was so good to get back, to see the ocean, walk on the beach, eat delicious seafood, and then we traveled just a little bit to Kingsville to see Angela and her new home and the place where she works at Texas A&M. Wonderful. In February, I spent a week visiting my family in Minnesota again. I'd, I'd always wanted to take a winter vacation, get that experience. So I was up there for a week. And, you know, the reason I went during the winter is my uncles work incredibly hard during the spring, the summer, and the fall. Because their work is underground telephone and power cable installation, which is cable plowing. That means the ground has to be soft enough to plow. In the winter, it freezes. That work has to stop. Now, granted, they still do the work of running the business, preparing for the next season, but the pace is so much slower in the winter. So again, I got to spend time visiting uncles and aunts and cousins. We played cribbage. We went ice fishing. We had fish fries. We went snowmobiling. It was wonderful. Even if, because of the, the winter ice, I had a couple of unplanned entries into the Sidewalk Olympics. <laughs> if those trips sounded great to you, they absolutely were. Nothing wrong with my time off. That's not my problem. You have a question? You know, I feel like I placed first and last in those entries. <laughs> My, you know you're getting old when your, your cousin rushes over and says, are you okay, instead of laughing at you, you know. <laughs> I knew I'd, I'd passed another plateau. It's like, uh. <laughs> but what about my time on? I remember a few weeks ago thinking on a Sunday morning, I've got to prep a sermon for Good Friday. I've got to prep a sermon for Easter Sunday. I've got a person who reached out to Abundant Life through the He Gets Us campaign that wanted pastoral counseling on a Tuesday. I was the SAPD chaplain on call that week, and I was scheduled to teach two days at the police academy for San Antonio College. And I thought, how am I going to get it all done? Well, it turned out I wasn't. After I had lunch, uh, I, I couldn't make it home. I had to stop and pull off in a parking lot and sleep before I could make the drive back to the lake. And that concerned me because three years ago, before I had congestive heart failure, that was an early warning sign, that type of fatigue. And I ignored it back then. I won't ignore it now. When I got home, it, it got worse. My heart slipped out of rhythm. and. The issue with that is that when my heart goes out of rhythm, many times my heart rate skyrockets. So I was up over 150 beats per minute sitting on a couch. For a, a man my age, 150 beats per minute is what you should achieve in a run. That went on for hours, and my heart was out of rhythm for four days. It meant extra trips to the hospital extra trips to the cardiologist, the extra $1,500 to pay my deductible for those. Something had to change. Like my friend Kerry said, time off won't heal you when your problem is how you spend time on. So I've been thinking about the pace I've had for so many years and taking a look at the pace that Jesus had. What was the Lord's pace? Jesus walked. He walked. He chose that particular time in history to come to earth and do the most important work that has ever been done, walking. That doesn't make any sense to my modern mind. Why wouldn't he come today so he could be interviewed on talk shows? Jesus, what is the way to heaven? Reach millions. He could have jetted all over the world for his personal appearance, speaking to stadiums. His parables and his wisdom could have gone viral. But he chose to walk. What did walking give Jesus 
time to do. Well, Jesus had time to stop and help people when he was on the way to other commitments. Let's look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 to 22. As Jesus was saying this, the leader of a synagogue came and knelt before him. My daughter has just died, he said. But you can bring her back to life again if you just come and lay your hand on her. Now, raising the dead sounds like important work to me, doesn't it? I have to admit that's more important than any work I've ever done. So Jesus gets up. We'll continue in verse 19. So Jesus and his disciples got up and went with them. Just then a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind them. She touched the fringe of his robe for she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be healed. Jesus turned around and when he saw her said, daughter, be encouraged, your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed that moment. Jesus had time to help people. Do you have time to help people? If you're moving too fast to help others, you're moving too fast. Jesus walked. Why do you run? Jesus had time to spend with his friends. In Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 32, the 12 disciples had just returned from going out two by two, healing the sick, casting out demons, and preaching the gospel. Let's look at verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by the boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. Jesus spent time with his friends. Do you have time to spend with your friends? If you're moving too fast to spend time with your friends, you're moving too fast. Jesus walked. Why do you run? Jesus had time to pray to his Father. Mark chapter 1 describes much of the ministry that Jesus was doing, but then Mark notes something interesting. Let's take a look at chapter 1, verse 35. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Even when ministering to thousands, Jesus had time. He took time to get away by himself with God the Father. Do you have time to pray to your Father? If you're moving too fast to pray to your Father, you're moving too fast. Jesus walked. Why do you run? Jesus was never distracted from his purpose. He had the most important work to do that had ever been done on this earth. And I can tell you with confidence that whatever you're doing that keeps you at that breakneck pace is less important than the work that Jesus did. And Jesus walked. Why do you run? My pace didn't look anything like the Lord's. I'm changing that. I'd be way more comfortable preaching this message if I had the pace of life figured out. But I don't. This isn't an area I've done well in. But it seems like most of the messages I bring to you don't come from what I've mastered, but what the Lord's working in me right now. <coughs> So what did my pace look like this week? Did the demands on my time change? No, they did not. But my response to those demands did change. The police academy wanted me to go to a three-day course on impact weapons so that I could be certified to teach cadets how to fight with extendable batons. Now, most of the training I do to keep my Texas Peace Officer license current is on my own time. It's unpaid. But this, I would receive three days' pay for this. The problem is that one of those days was May 3rd, my son David's birthday. So I turned it down. I turned down the work. I turned down the money. I turned down the opportunity. Instead, I chartered a fishing trip, and David and I spent the afternoon hauling in redfish for his birthday. On Thursday, there was an SAPD peer support training scheduled, something I normally go to as a chaplain. Thursday morning, a friend texted me and said, are you going to be late 
to the training today? And I replied, I'm going to be so late that I'm not even going to be there. And I'm spending the day with my son. I spent another wonderful day with my son looking for rifles that he wanted to purchase, similar to what he carried when he was deployed. On Saturday, family came out to the house and I barbecued chicken to celebrate David's birthday together. Time with family. Time with friends. I still got work done. I handled the business of the church as we look at selling our property. I prepared this message. The important work got done, but some things I just let drop so that I would have time for the most important things. Now, most of us would say that we put God first, then family and friends, and then work. But does our schedule confirm what we tell ourselves is important? Does our schedule say that we're lying about what our true priorities are? Jesus walked. Why do you run? Time off won't heal you. And your problem is how you spend your time on. What does your time on look like? Does it feel like an easy walk or a desperate sprint with no end in sight? Do you resonate with Job when he said, I have no peace, I have no quiet, I have no rest? And trouble just keeps coming. There's hope. Your life can change. Jesus said, come to me, all who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and put it on you, and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest, for the yoke I give you is easy. The load I put on you is light. Well, that all sounds great, Pastor, but how about something practical? How do we even start to change? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I've got one simple thing that I've done that I'd like you to try this week. Now, just for a week, if you don't like it, you can go right back to your breakneck pace that you're used to. But I've eliminated the phrase, I have to, from my vocabulary. I don't say, I have to go teach at the police academy. I'll say I get to teach at the academy today. I have an opportunity to pour experience and wisdom into cadets that can help them thrive in their careers. I don't say I have to write a sermon this week. I say, Lord Jesus, I have the opportunity to speak to your people. What would you have me say? I've seen the same thing as I was raising children. What do you say? I have to go to a choir concert tonight. I have to take the kids to their practice. That kind of phrasing, it's incorrect for one thing. The truth is there's very little I have to do. There's very little that you have to do. There's a lot you choose to do. So when another request for your time comes up this week, consider it. Don't say, oh, no, I have to do one more thing. No, you don't. You don't. You can choose to do it, or you can choose to not do it. It's up to you. If you choose to do it, don't say, I have to. I get to do this. If you choose not to do it, say, I don't have to do this. But get rid of that I have to thought. That makes you feel powerless, like the universe is conspiring against you to make you do something that you don't want to do. Eliminating that phrase gives you power over your schedule, over your pace, power over your time, power over your life. God gave you that authority. Don't surrender to someone else's demands on your time. Jesus walked. Why do you run? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you said, come to me, all you who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. You said that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Many times my yoke isn't easy. My burden is too heavy for me to carry. Please take it from me and give me your burden. Show me the work you have for me. Lead me to the people you want me to meet and give me the words you want me to say. Help me to walk at your pace, Jesus. Amen. Well, I'll, I'll give an opportunity for some insight or thoughts on the message.
people are still wondering how I couldn't pass a, a suitcase any neater than that. All right, Sherry. After our, after our trip to Florida, um, we had a, a direct lesson in the need for margin. And they said, oh, you need to get to the airport three hours before your flight. Oh my gosh, three hours before your flight? You've gotta be kidding. Nope, they were not kidding. <laughs> and we got to see our plane leave without us as we approached the gate. It was awful, awful. Do you look a little bit like I did? <laughs> we looked very deflated. <laughs> what are we gonna do now? Are we gonna spend the night at the airport? No, we found a hotel. But the need for margin is really, really um, felt. And it's just so much nicer when you can walk. Absolutely. You know, it, it can be so hard to take a day off. I'd taken a day off, I'd chartered a fishing trip, and I thought, I can squeeze one more thing in. <laughs> so I asked David if he would meet me at, at uh, a dealership to bring in one of the cars that needs some work, and he said yes. I looked at my watch and I thought, it's gonna make this so tight. We're barely gonna get to drop it off before we have to turn around and get to the docks. It's gonna make it no fun, it's gonna be too much pressure. So I called him back, I said, son, let's do that another day. Today, let's, let's just go fishing. And then we had time to go have lunch before we got there. Sure enough, the guide texted us and said, hey, I'm here a little bit early if you guys wanna start fishing. So. It worked out, but you're so right. We have to build margin into our lives, and that is foreign in our culture. We're, we wear that as a badge of honor. How are you doing? What do we say? Oh, I'm so busy. So busy. I got to do this. I got to do that. I'm so busy. We wear that like a badge of honor, but it's not. Mom. Well, she pretty much said it all. But I... You went to Disneyland, too? <laughs> no, I did not. I'm so <laughs> thankful that I was quietly staying at home doing my stuff. <laughs> I was just thinking how important our words are. By just changing that phrase, it changes everything. Yes. And, it, and we've looked at this before, but death and life is in the power of the tongue. And what we say and how we say it is just incredibly powerful. Yep. I've gone a couple months without having, w without saying I have to. And there's, there's some times when there's something that you don't want to do, but you feel like you should, right? And, and so you might not go, oh, I get to, but I've learned to not say anything then or, or say, I'm going to do this. I never say, I have to do this because no, I don't. No, I don't. Andy Stanley is a, a pastor and an author. He, he's got many churches in the Atlanta, Georgia area. And his main church, I don't know, maybe 3,000 at a service, maybe more. You know, it's a huge church. And he said, as he was driving to church one day, he thought, you know what? I don't have to go. I could just turn around and go somewhere else. I don't, I don't have to show up. And I thought, if Andy Stanley doesn't have to go to church, <laughs> there's not a whole lot that I have to do. And it gives you freedom because you realize, I'm choosing to do this. There's good reasons I'm choosing to do it but it's a choice, I'm free. Anybody else? Yes, Woody. I remember when I was working and uh, you know, we had eight and a half acres of land and there was a lot of, a lot of land to work and things to do and stuff. And you know, you're looking forward to the weekend, I gotta do this, I have to do this, I have to do this. Next thing I know, come Sunday night, I'm exhausted and it's like, I was more exhausted on the weekend doing things than you know, going back to work. Yeah. Anyone else? We're going to move on to announcements. Our next ladies Bible study and brunch is tomorrow at Sharon Ripley's house at 1030. There is a sign up sheet in the back for that. If you're going, please sign up so that she knows how much food to prepare. That's always a good time, always a good teaching. Our next men's breakfast and Bible study will be here at the church this Saturday, May 13th, uh, 9 o'clock in the morning. We do not have a sign-up sheet for that, but I'm sure we'll get a text out to y'all later in the week 
to say, let Chad know if you want tacos <laughs> so that I can bring tacos for you. But that's always good when the men get together as well. Now, next Sunday, um, Pastor Ryan Pena will be sharing uh, on Mother's Day. And also, we have something special happening. After the service, Samaya would like to be baptized. And we're going to baptize her uh, at David and Tammy Bombersbach's house. Now, uh, her parents have said, you are welcome. I, I know it's Mother's Day, uh, so we're going to celebrate Mother's Day just a little after that. But if you would like to see Samaya baptized, uh, you're welcome to come over to Damien, David and Tammy Bombersbach's house after church next Sunday, and, and we'll have a special time there. Are there any other announcements that we need to share? I need to check with Laura. Are there any praise reports? <laughs> okay. She, she, she needed a sermon on pace. <laughs> okay, let's, let's stand and say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. If anybody needs prayer this morning, right after the service, if you go through this door and immediately to your left, we'll have some folks there to be happy to pray with you. Let's remain standing for our closing hymn. <coughs>
Oh, 